Hi, this is Under the Honda Mackinen, and welcome to my bottom 10 adventure games list. Now, a couple of years ago, I made a bottom 5 adventure games list, and the reason I did only 5 back then was because I honestly didn't want to shoehorn in 10 games, but I always felt a little bad because that list felt very short, especially because I have a top 10 adventure games list, and you might have noticed that I went out of my way to exclude games as well. Well, this time I went into a bit of a deep dive into some of the games that I mentioned and excluded last time in order to finally get this list up to a full 10. And of the five original bottom five entries, four are still on this list. But I'll keep the old list around just because I do think it was still pretty good. And you know, I hate long introductions, so let's get on with it. And number 10, Larry Magna Cum Laude. Now, nine days out of 10, I don't actually consider Larry Magna Cum Laude to be a proper Larry game. And there are some people out there who, who will even make the argument that it's not really an adventure game. And yes, while I don't consider Larry Magna Cum Laude to be a proper Larry game, it absolutely is an adventure game, just not a very conventional one. It's a narrative-based game where you have to complete seemingly mundane tasks in order to get busy with as many ladies as possible. The big difference to the old Larrys is the fact that instead of traditional puzzle solving, you typically play one of four different types of minigame. Either one of two different reaction-style games, the sperm-directing dialogue minigame, or that infuriating coin toss game. Now of all the games on this list, I think Magna Cum Laude honestly gets a worse rep than it deserves. The game is actually really, really funny, and even contains a lot of references to the old Larrys. The reason I don't consider it a proper Larry is just because you don't play as the original Larry, but that's because of the frat setting, which honestly wouldn't have made sense. So instead, you're playing as Larry's nephew. And I gotta admit, I'm not the biggest fan of the setting either, but especially the sperm-directing minigame, which contains really funny dialogue, is one of the main reasons to play this game. But yeah, the reason this one is maybe not a very good adventure game, even though it does at least contain some inventory collecting, is because it does get a bit monotonous. The, the fact that you literally just keep doing the same different types of minigames is the thing that really annoys me. I mean, seriously, when walking around in the overworld is the most fun and colorful part of the game, that's usually a sign that you've maybe fucked up. At number 9, Baddest of the Bands. This, of course, is the third episode of Strong Bad's Cool Game for Attractive People, which overall, of course, made my top 10 adventure games list. But Baddest of the Bands still ends up on this list because it is still my least favorite episode of the game. Now, I need to stress, Baddest of the Bands, of all the games on this list, is probably the one that has the least amount of actual flaws in it. It still has the funny Homestar Runner dialogue and jokes. It does have a couple of good puzzles in it. And the main reason I don't really like it is that it's a bit of a letdown because of Homestar Runner's excellent history with music-related parodies, which Badness of the Bands honestly completely fails at. Now granted, it was a tall order for Telltale or the Brothers Chaps to come up with a bunch of new excellent songs for just this one episode of a video game, but I am still a little annoyed that they couldn't pull it off. But, but like Larry Magna Cum Laude, I don't actually think this game is flat out awful. In fact, of the 10 games on this list, this along with Larry MCL are two games that I actually would willingly play outside of this list. At number eight, Siberia. This one was on the original list, and honestly, I don't have a lot of new to add to this. Now, Siberia definitely has a nice haunting atmosphere, where you play as the lawyer Kate trying to find the heir of a massive toy company. But the biggest problem with this game is that 80% of it is really just spent running between locations. The remaining 20% spent listening to painfully boring dialogue or solving puzzles. So the thing with Siberia is that it really doesn't give you a lot to do. And most of the characters are not just boring and annoying, with the sole exception of Oscar. The biggest thing that really kills Siberia for me is the lackluster oh, localization. The game is supposed to be set in Mid and Eastern Europe, but practically all of the characters you run into just speak with American accents, which just does not make any sense to me. Siberia is just a tedious game, and it's really frustrating because it really shouldn't have been. But beyond that, this is yet another game that doesn't have that many flat-out flaws, which is why it only ends up at number 8. At number 7, Alex Kidd in High Tech World. So, I actually endeavor to try to beat Alex Kidd in High Tech World to see if the game is really as mundane and boring as I thought it would be. And to my shock, the game is not just that. It is actually way more like traditional adventure games of the 1980s. That is to say, there are countless parts in this game that will put you in a game over state if you fuck up. The rest of your time is spent 
completing really mundane and boring puzzles. And worst of all, you even have a time limit in-game to get some of the stuff done. And although I mentioned that this is not really a proper Alex Kidd game, because it was Doki Doki panicked out of a completely unrelated game, it does have a shitty side-scrolling sequence. So, it's not just a bad adventure game, it's also a terrible platformer. And the thing that really hit the nail on the head for me to include this game is that there's a point in the game where you literally have to visit a shrine 100 times to get into the final part of the game. Like, seriously, they put this in the game. But with all of that said, yet again, the reason I don't really want to put it any lower is at least the first act of the game, which takes place inside the palace, is somewhat doable once you learn where all the different death traps are and you make sure to avoid them. That doesn't stop them putting more of in later in the game. But just like Siberia, I would rather describe this game as mind-numbingly tedious. But yeah, the platforming segments also make it a little bit more frustrating. At number 6, A Troll's Tale. Now before some people get really angry at me, yes, this is an adventure game meant for children. Developed by Sierra, but unlike traditional Sierra games of the 1980s, this one is not actually filled with death traps. On the contrary, you can't actually die in this game. So what do you do in Troll's Tale? Well, you explore a cave to find 15 treasures and then help a gnome escape. Again, some people might even make the argument that this is not technically an adventure game, but you don't really solve puzzles in this one either, so if Larry Magna Cum Laude is an adventure game, A Troll's Tale absolutely is as well. There are two points where you have to make multiple choices that where picking the right choice is required in order to make any progress. But beyond that, the only thing holding you back is that if the troll happens to be on the screen at the same time, you can't grab the items you're trying to collect. Now, because this is an adventure game that was meant for children, some of you might feel that it's a bit harsh to have it on this list. But I have played adventure games that were meant for children that played a lot more like actual adventure games than this one. Troll's Tale is just tedious. Furthermore, I just have a really bad sense of geography with this game. I really have no idea where I am half the time, although luckily there's such a small amount of locations that eventually you will poke through every nook and cranny of the game world. Yes, I know the physical game ca actually came with a map, but obviously I just downloaded this one online, so I don't have it. Fun fact, Al Lowe actually worked on this game. Now, apart from just being mind-numbingly tedious, the other thing about this game that really gets on my nerves are the graphics. And I will implore you that if you are going to play Troll's Tale, do not do it while the game is full screened. Because this CGA barf really started to hurt my eyes after a while. So here we have an example of an adventure game that is maybe a victim of the era in which it was made. So that's why I didn't have the heart to put it in the bottom five. At number 5, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, The Graphic Adventure. Now last time I included Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, and don't get me wrong, I still hate that game. But after actually trying to be the first Indiana Jones adventure game made by LucasArts, I have to concede that this game is honestly way worse. And it's inconceivable to me that LucasArts could create not one, but two terrible Indiana Jones adventure games. I mean, The Last Crusade has some of the same bullshit design choices. It's honestly a little bit more frustrating because the puzzle randomization is even higher in this one. There's a bunch of locations where you can't really do anything. And you spend a lot more time dodging Nazis with occasional fisticuffs to break up the monotony. I mean, Fate of Atlantis was also badly designed, but there were actually chunks of the game that I could actually get by without having to look at a walkthrough every once in a while. However, the thing that really pushes Last Crusade over the edge for me, apart from the various ways you can put yourself in an unwinnable state, but these map navigation sequences, what the hell is this garbage? I mean, they're shamelessly padding a game out or forcing you to do things multiple times, but these are just inexcusable. I hate them. Them. And honestly, they put the worst one of these at the very beginning when you're going around the tunnels underneath Dennis. And here's the thing, I like Indiana Jones, but I do not like Indiana Jones enough to actually put up with this garbage. Number four, Runaway 2, Dream of the Turtle. I know, some of you are getting a bit nervous now that there are actually two games that I consider w even worse than this, other than the obvious one. So once again, I'm going to have to concede that Runaway 2, while it is a bad adventure game, does have a lot going for it. The slick audio design, the better localization than the first Runaway. I mean, the main issue I really have with Runaway 2 is that the game's puzzle design is just so goddamn obstinate. Dream of the Turtle just does not want to tell you what the hell you're supposed to be doing at any one time. I've said this before, even though Runaway 1's localization effort was a lot more hammy, 
The fact that the characters talked so much really made sure that you were never clueless about what you were supposed to be doing. While they did a much better job adapting the dialogue from the original Spanish, this game is just impossible to figure out at times. You need to revisit locations so many times, do just seemingly arbitrarily minor things in order to progress, that trying to make any kind of progress on your own just becomes frustrating. Plus, even just walking around is really tiresome because you can't get out of most areas without scrolling the screen. I don't really have much else to add here, so I'll just cap it off here. Number 3, Maniac Mansion. Yes, I know, this game is the origins of the Scum Mansion. Without it, the LucasArts wouldn't have made all those other cool adventure games, yada yada yada, blah blah blah. Maniac Mansion has a lot of historical significance. That much is clear. But when the game's own creator admits that the game sucks, I think I'm entitled to say that Maniac Mansion might be one of the single most frustrating adventure games that has ever been put together by human hands. A big problem of this is the design choice that Ron Gilbert admitted he did with the game, which is that any two items in the game world that can realistically interact with each other, they allow to. Which means that the game is just loaded with traps, where you can accidentally use an inventory item necessary for beating the game without ever realizing it, putting you permanently in a state where you can't complete the game. And once you start to look at all the individual steps required to even beat the game, it becomes incredibly obvious that Ron Gilbert just lacked restraint in his game design. Because Maniac Mansion is one of those adventure games where it's completely impossible to make any progress in any reasonable amount of time without fucking yourself three times over in the process. And Maniac Mansion is also unfortunately a game on this list that does suffer from the fact that it is such an early crude game. It lacks a lot of the refinement that would come from the later Scum Engine games. There's a complete distinct lack of context clues. The presentation is so fucked I can barely tell what's going on half the time. There isn't really an implicit internal logic to a lot of the stuff that you need to do in order to progress, and the fact that interactive hotspots aren't just shown to you when you hover over with a mouse means that you can easily miss stuff in the background. Which makes playing through this game without a walkthrough a real fucking chore, and even if you do have one, you will still most likely probably fuck up a few times because there are certain time-sensitive things that you have to do in the game. So, Maniac Mansion is frustrating. But it is also a significant game because all the mistakes that Ron Gilbert made with this game informed him when he would eventually make The Secret of Monkey Island, which is one of my all-time favorite games. At number 2, The Eleventh Hour. Eleventh Hour is of course the sequel to The Seventh Guest, and I reviewed both of these games not too long ago. Now, while The Seventh Guest is definitely a game that hasn't aged very gracefully, it is still a really fun spooky adventure game with fun spooky FMVs. Now the 11th hour contains almost all of the elements of the 7th guest in it, but somehow manages to do them way worse. The characters aren't as interesting, the cutscenes are honestly much worse, and a lot of the puzzles are just super frustrating and annoying and not that much fun to solve. Which is weird because in a lot of other ways the presentation in this game is a lot better, but also the game forces you to pixel hunt by just clicking random items in the mansion in an effort to pad out the game a little bit. And your only reward for doing this pixel hunting is often staring at those same god awful cutscenes. The seventh guest is aged but very charming in its own way, the eleventh hour is just but ugly, boring, tedious, and just honestly not that much fun. I actually have full let's plays of both of these games as well as the unofficial third game on my second channel if you want to go check them out. But yeah, I wasn't joking when I said this is one of my least favorite adventure games. And number one, of course, it's still Broken Sword for The Angel of Death. I mean, I've talked so much about this game. It is my least favorite entry from one of my favorite adventure game series. An adventure game that honestly just looks unfinished, with terrible puzzles, terrible voice acting, terrible characters, and a badly written plot. I have a review video on this one if you want to check out all the individual things that piss me off about it. And that's all from me for now. Tell me, what are your least favorite adventure games? I'm Hunter the Hunter Mackinnon. See you on the next one. Bye bye